Thank you. And again, thanks to the other three um, presenters. Um, I'll try to make some initial brief observations and then highlight a few um, key areas from the report um, to look at in a bit more depth. Um, I think it's obviously worth noting that although there's obviously commonalities between um, Darfur, South Kordofan, Blue Nile and Jonglei, um, there's also some significant differences between those three contexts. So in some ways it's hard to sort of um, talk in generalities, but I will try and sort of synthesise some of the key issues coming out. Um, I think one point to note is that the reports um, highlight how challenges to access in Sudan and South Sudan have um, evolved over, been constantly evolving over the past 10 years um, or longer. Um, and I think, again, looking for into forward, we can see that you know, the challenges the humanitarian community is facing are going to continue to evolve. Um, so we're not just looking at how do we deal with things now, but how do we deal with the um, evolving challenges we'll be facing in, in the future. Um, I'd also note, I think, that the, the concept of either, either government-controlled territory or armed non-state actor-controlled territory is a convenient shorthand, but maybe somewhat misleading. Um, often there are no clear front lines, and it may not be entirely clear who's actually in control of a certain area, um, or kind of how they um, how much control they actually have, where the um, chain of command lies, um, or where their allegiances lie. Um, so, who, you know, what are these areas we're actually talking about? How do we, how do we define them? Um, and then when we're talking about access to um, armed non-state actor areas, um, are we talking about cross line or cross border? Um, the focus in Darfur has been almost exclusively on cross-line, although Jonathan's report also flagged the potential for, for cross-border um, or increased um, maybe interest in cross-border. Um, South Sudan under OLS, was, um, there was much more attention to um, cross-border access. Um, and yet when you start talking about that, was um, with the consent of the government. Um, but also you can also talk about cross-border access, um, non-consensual cross-border access without the consent of the government. Um, and each of those different modalities throws up its own complications. So what are we, what are we actually talking about in each context? Um, so that's just some sort of initial brief remarks to, uh, around the issues we're discussing to look at some of the, the key challenges in, in more depth. Um, I think there's a big question around how we frame the problem. Um, or how we, fr how we frame the issue. Are we talking about um, dealing with a sovereign government or are we talking about dealing with two or more parties to a conflict? Um, and both reports, both on Blue Nile and South Kordofan and Darfur, raised criticisms of um, the old UNMIS and then also of UNAMID. Um, and I think that highlights how the UN, being an organisation of member states, um, <coughs> tends to view governments as being leg the legitimate authority and therefore focuses its negotiations relations on them rather than on dealing with armed non-state actors. Um, and that then enables um, governments to limit access to non-state actor areas um, by portraying themselves as the, the sovereign government, the sole legitimate authority, um, and not wanting to be recognised as a party to a conflict, but just saying they're the, they're the authority in charge. Um, and feeling that any negotiations with a non-state actor is legitimising that non-state actor. Um, meanwhile, other people would say, well, actually, you have a situation of an armed conflict, you have two or more parties, you need to negotiate access um, to all populations in need with, 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 with whichever parties are involved in, in that conflict. Um, so I think that dichotomy between the, the role of the le legitimate government versus the role of two or more parties in an armed conflict is very important, um, but often it's not even flagged up as being an issue or, or a topic that different people have different opinions on. Um, so again, which, which viewpoints are we subscribing to and how is that being... How is that being addressed? Um, I think the reports also highlighted the importance of perceptions and the different perceptions that various groups bring to these matters. Um, again, governments tend to have the perception that providing any assistance in areas outside their control is helping the rebels, helping the other side. Um, and this perception from most parties in a conflict that if you're helping anyone who's in the area controlled by the other party, then by definition you're, you're not neutral. Um, being neutral means helping only one side in their, in their view. Um, meanwhile, um, local communities can be very distrustful of cross-line assistance. Um, even during the CPA interim period, there are reports from South Kordofan of local communities in SPLA-controlled areas feeling that um, any medical supplies coming cross-line would be, you know, would be poison. It wouldn't be safe for them to use those medicines because there was such a high level of distrust. Um, and some of the reports also flagged the issues with perceptions of national staff. Um, NGOs in Sudan and South Sudan are increasingly reliant on national staff for their operations. Um, but there's problems with sending staff of certain ethnicities into areas controlled by other actors. Um, and there's also issues with 
national staff who've been working cross line when they return back to um, their home areas to um, issue concern that will be picked up by the authorities and interrogated over what they've seen in the area controlled by the by the other parties of the conflict. Um, I think another sort of a key key questions that have come up in some of the reports, and in particular the challenge from at the end of Jonathan's presentation was. Um, this perception or this, yeah, this feeling that um, aid agencies, in particular NGOs, maybe haven't done enough um, to focus on negotiating access or achieving access to areas controlled by non-state actors, in particular maybe in Darfur and in Blue Nile South Kordofan. Um, so it'd be useful to look at kind of what are some of those constraints? Why haven't agencies been able to do more in, in that regard? Um, and I think it's worth noting that working even working in government-held areas is complex enough due to the level of often bureaucratic restrictions and other operating constraints. Um, and although these reports are focused mainly on um, negotiations with armed non-state actors, in most cases if agencies wish to work in um, non-state actor areas, they first of all need to do very difficult negotiations with the government authorities to get there, and then they need to negotiate with the non-state actors themselves in order to, to be there as well. Um, so I think due to this sort of the double level of, level of negotiation needed to work in non-state actor areas and also again maybe the focus of the UN on the, the role of the government as being the, the sovereign authority, um, many NGOs haven't had so much attention to negotiating with, with armed, armed non-state actors. It's been easier to focus on um, working in government areas or looking to other people to negotiate the access to the non-state armed actor areas on their behalf. Um, and certainly discussions amongst NGOs in both um, Khartoum and Juba have tended to focus on negotiating the, um, the government restrictions, the bureaucratic impediments, the visas and so forth, rather than on negotiating access with the, the different non-state actor groups. Um, it also seems that many NGOs look towards OCHA to negotiate um, their access into these areas. In particular, they would like to see um, greater leadership from the UN in um, ensuring access to these areas. Um, Again, the Darfur report shows how in the early days of the Darfur crisis, um, Archer did a huge amount of work in negotiating cross-line access with the, the non-state armed actors. Um, and again, it's been doing that, as Nikki um, spoke about in Jonglay more recently. Um, but when we look at the situation currently in, in Darfur and South Kordofan and Blue Nile, we don't see the same level of engagement um, by the UN in those kind of ensuring those kind of negotiations for access for, for NGOs. Um, and again, it seems a lot of that seems to come down to the, the personalities of individual UN staff involved. How much are they willing to um, invest in negotiating access to, to non-state armed actor areas? I think also, again, when we're looking at the constraints on agencies, a lot depends on the individual personalities within, within NGOs. Um, it seems in Darfur, various, um, you know, where there were good field program coordinators in place, they may have been um, negotiating access on a local level, um, but often maybe on their own initiative without the support of or, or oversight from their capital offices in, um, in Khartoum, let alone their overall agency HQs. Um, and often negotiations with armed non-state actors will need to take place at local level, but are the agency staff at field level given the necessary support and the skill sets to carry out those negotiations? Do they have the, I say, the the skills to do that effectively and again given the high turnover of staff in these places one person may have done a good job of negotiating access but what happens when that person moves on um, if there's systems in place to, to enable that to continue um, as no noted in the some of the reports there have been some notable exceptions of where agencies have done a very good job of um, negotiating access with the armed non-state actors um, in particular I think the MSFs and ICRC um, but it seems there hasn't been so much systematic sharing of their experiences and best practice and contact and contacts enable other agencies to benefit from, from that access. Um, just some closing thoughts. Um, again, this kind of question around, is it possible to overcome the current constraints, looking again at these, these three different areas, in particular the two areas in, in Sudan, what can be done to overcome those constraints? Um, and I think the question there is, is any significant increase in cross-line access realistically possible, um, given the constraints we know about with um, say the bureaucratic restrictions and the threats to national staff involved in these processes, um, is it po actually possible to improve cross-line access? Even in the OLS days, which was theoretically had provisions for cross-line access, most things were actually done cross-border. Um, and obviously if, if cross-line is not, access is not possible, then cross-border is the, is the alternative. Um, 
However, again, cross-border access, especially non-consensual cross-border access, has very significant problems. Um, it may well need to come from agencies who aren't working in government-controlled areas due to the risk of um, for agencies who do have the risk of pro to programs of agencies who do have operations in government controlled areas. Um, however, that, that then creates a gap between the agencies who are working in the government held areas, the agencies who are working in um, armed non state actor areas, um, and fuels this perception that agencies on either side are only helping one side, they're not being neutral and impartial in how they're providing assistance. Um, so, I do think we need to find ways to. Um, address the bureaucratic restrictions on agencies working in armed non-state actor areas and also improve the ability of agencies to negotiate with armed non-state actors directly. Um, it does seem that agencies would appreciate more support and leadership from the UN, um, but I think there's also a need for agencies themselves to address their own capacity, both to address the bureaucratic restrictions and to um, undertake local level negotiations with all actors, government authorities, armed non-state actors, local communities and so forth and again, make sure that's an organisational commitment rather than leaving it to the, the skill sets of individual staff. Thank you.